welcome and to the second event from the Remixing the Classics Research Network. Like I said, my name is Erin and I'm one of the co-chairs of Remixing the Classics, which is exploring how digital technologies are being used to remake and re-experience classic literature and drama. I want to start by thanking our funders, the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council, our partner, the Association of Adaptation Studies, my co-chair, Deborah Cartmel, who you'll be hearing from in a few minutes, our project assistant, Beth Sherrick, who's working behind the scenes to make sure this call runs as smoothly as it can, and she'll be putting some links into the chat that you can follow if you wish as we go. And finally, our brilliant American Sign Language interpreters, Jackie Lightfoot and Christina Whitehouse Suggs, who are helping us make this event more inclusive for ASL speakers. Live automated captions are also available for this event, so please feel free to turn those on if they're helpful for you. And I should also say that the event is best viewed in gallery view, which will allow you to see the speaker and the interpreter together. Please also feel free as audience members to use the chat constructively and respectfully during this event. In fact, I've seen that some people have already started saying hello and saying where they're logging in from around the world. So please feel free to do that. It's great to, to hear from you all um, and to know where you're joining us from. Right now, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina in the United States, where I'm visiting family in between stops on a research trip. And the fact that I can be away from my normal workspace in the UK while also being present at this seminar is one of the great benefits of digital and hybrid working, though it raises its own challenges, of course, and that's something we might discuss today during the seminar. Hopefully one of those challenges won't be my small daughter running in, but we'll see. Before we get going with the seminar, I'd like to briefly tell you a little bit about remixing the classics. At the heart of this project is an interest in what digital technologies bring artistically, pedagogically, politically, to the retelling of old stories. To get things started, we've programmed a series of online seminars that will take place between now and June. You can see the flyer for the program by following the link in the chat. We're also working on making the recordings of the seminars available as we go for those who aren't able to attend live. We're in the process of preparing our recording for our last seminar, which was excellent on video games and virtual worlds. And we hope to post it online soon. So more information coming on that. Through the network, we want to bring academics, creative practitioners, teachers, cultural programmers into conversation with one another. We want to explore the exciting possibilities that digital technologies enable, as well as the new barriers they could create. You can read more information about the project on our website, link in the chat. And you can also become part of the network yourself by filling in the form that again, you can find by using the link in the chat. By signing up for the network, you'll receive email updates about upcoming events and recordings. Though I promise it's not too many emails, we'll be very sparing in communications. There's already over 50 people involved in the network and we hope to continue to grow in the coming months. In addition to the online seminars, we'll be hosting a free, hybrid workshop in July, exploring the preliminary findings of the Remixing the Classics project. It will take place in Birmingham in the UK, but it will also be streamed online. We'll have more details about that soon. And finally, in August, we'll be hosting an online conference on digital adaptations and putting together a journal special issue on the topic. I'm going to turn over now to my co-chair, Deborah Cartmel, to tell you a little bit more about that. Thank you very much, Sharon, and thank you for, um, for, for all the technological um, skills that you've displayed today. Um, as part of the network, we will be publishing a special issue of the journal Adaptation, which is published by Oxford University Press. Um, submissions are open to everyone, and you can access the journal online, and I'll put the uh, website in the chat. Um, so, so, the deadline for the submissions is 1st of December, but you can submit any time. Uh, the journal publishes e-first, and if you, your work is accepted, it will be published around three weeks um, after you receive an official acceptance. Um, Adaptation is the journal of the Association of Adaptation Studies, who are the project's partners, as Erin has said. And if anyone wants to get involved in the association, you can join by visiting the association's website. And I'll put that in, in the chat as well. And we would really, the journal in particular, would really welcome papers on this topic, as it's an area which is 
unfortunately underrepresented at present. So I'll pass you back to Erin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Um, one last thing about the network before we get going with the seminar. Um, through these events, we're trying to gather some insights into how online seminars and conferences can be made as engaging, accessible, and sustainable as possible. So we've set up a short six question survey that will hopefully appear at the end of this Zoom event. And if you could take a minute to fill it in, we'd be really grateful. It's now my pleasure to turn our attention to today's seminar on Accessing Digital Adaptations, Perspectives on Inclusion, and to welcome our wonderful trio of speakers who have generously agreed to share their time and their work with us today. As we all know, digital technologies have opened up so many new possibilities for access, creativity, and connection, but they've also created new challenges and barriers nearly half of the world's population is disadvantaged by restricted access to digital technology, resulting in something that we now widely call the digital divide. And at the same time, digital platforms, tools, algorithms, privilege certain kinds of users while marginalizing others. In this seminar, we want to talk about how these issues are affecting a wide variety of creators and audiences, from primary school students, to people with disabilities, to those who live outside of traditional centers of political power, and many others beyond that. Before we begin, I want to emphasize that we really don't want to collapse the distinctions between different groups of users. The challenges facing different people are unique, and we know that there's no single solution to creating inclusive, globally representative digital adaptations of classic texts. But as one of our speakers really helpfully and constructively put it, talking across user groups might open up the possibility that people coming to this event with one understanding of accessibility will leave thinking about other types that they didn't consider before. So that we hope, so in that sense, we hope that putting these different conversations together is constructive without having a flattening um, or homogenizing effect. We hope this proves true, and we're so grateful to our speakers for sharing their time, expertise, and experience with us today as we try to work through these difficult but really pressing issues. The format for today is that each of our guests will speak for 10 minutes, and then we'll use the second half of the seminar for discussion. We hope that you, the audience, will get involved in that discussion. You can submit questions using the Q&A button in your Zoom toolbar. And you can also contribute comments and further thoughts through the chat. And me, Deborah, and Beth will do our best to keep an eye on everything. Please remember, of course, to keep the tone of the discussion respectful at all times. We're really looking forward to having a conversation with you. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker. Jill Bradbury is Professor and Departmental Chair at Rochester Institute of Technology's National Technical Institute for the Deaf. Her research focuses on the history of deaf theater in America, especially Shakespeare. She's the project director of Pro Tactile Shakespeare, an initiative funded by the National Endowment for the Arts that seeks to create theater by and for the deaf blinds. In that project, she asks, how do artistic processes and practices lead to exclusionary theater? What would inclusive rather than accessible theater processes look like? for audiences who are too often marginalized. We're grateful to Jill for being with us today and helping us ask these questions of digital technologies and the adaptations they create. So I'll hand over to Jill now. I'm really happy to be here today. I want to thank Erin for bringing me um, to speak at today's seminar on accessing digital adaptation. Um, full disclosure, I don't work on digital adaptations myself, but I am passionate about accessibility and inclusion for people with disabilities. So my remarks today will focus on why we should think about these issues in the context of digital adaptation, and I also mention a few resources that could help those who are creating digital adaptations with the work of improving accessibility for people with disabilities. So the first thing to start with is the intended audience. If you are working on a digital adaptation, who are you envisioning as its users? 
Perhaps you have not thought about this beyond scholars, students, or generally interested people. Um, unfortunately, when designers don't consciously reflect on their presuppositions about their audience, ableist bias can come into play. And for those who are not familiar with the term, ableism is discrimination or prejudice against people with disabilities. 85% of the world's population does not have a disability. So it's easy to assume that the bodies sitting at the other side of the interface are normal in the statistical sense. But as Rosemary Garland Thompson has argued, though bodily norms also easily become what she calls normate, bodily configuration that take on cultural capital and authority. People with disabilities experience many obstacles to full participation in cultural, educational, and social environments. Within digital contexts, Stephanie Kirschbaum has coined the term multimodal inhospitality to describe the design and production of multimodal text and environments that persistently ignore access except as a retrofit. And retrofits are problematic, Kirschbaum argues, because they tend to be added on only after complaints are lodged and determined to be legitimate. An often drawn out process that frequently involves legal action by the complainant. Retrofits are also problematic because they do not change the culture of access within digital environments. Changing this culture is not necessarily difficult, but it does require forethought and budget planning. Universal design theory is a great place to start thinking about building accessibility and inclusion into digital adaptation. UDL originated in architecture and then spread to industrial design, information technology, and education. It approaches access for people with disabilities not as something added to a building or product, but as a fundamental condition of good design. According to Ron Mace, one of the founders of UDL, quote, universal design is the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. The term user-centered design has also become a popular way of thinking about this approach because it sharpens the focus on the needs, abilities, and limitations of diverse users instead of assuming a homogenous normate user. Over the past 20 years, some exciting research and work has been happening within universal design in digital environments. For example, more and more video game designers are focusing on ensuring their games can be played by people who have fine motor, auditory, or visual disabilities. Organizations such as the United States-based Games for Change are encouraging the next generation of video game developers to create products built on universal design principles. Researchers are also working on how tactile and audio mapping can enable people who are blind or have low vision to experience the visual elements of video games. Another place to start with understanding accessibility in digital content creation is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, developed by the International World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C. The WCAG guidelines are based on four principles, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. The first two principles are most relevant to digital content creators, so I want to unpack them a little bit. Perceivable, this means that information and user interface components must be presented in ways that all users can perceive. Avenues to support this principle include text alternatives for non-text content, such as captioning and image descriptions from multimedia. Operable, all users must be able to navigate interface components and interactions. 
Avenues to support this principle include multiple forms of site navigation and interactivity beyond the common mouse point and click. For example, there can be key-based control and voice-based navigation. It's also important to avoid content with light flashing more than four times per second, as this can cause seizures for some people with epilepsy. And after I finish my presentation, I will drop in the chat a link to accessibility basics from the United States government organization usability.gov. This link to a web page that gives an overview of best practices to support these first two principles of perceivable and operable. Now I'll briefly touch on the last two principles which have more to do with coding than digital environment design per se. The third principle, understandable. Information and the operation of the user interface must be understandable, meaning that users should be able to understand the information as well as the operation of the user interface. Avenues to support this principle include making text readable and understandable to the widest variety of audiences, making content appear and operate in predictable ways, and helping users avoid and correct mistakes. All of which, of course, will benefit multiple users, not just people with disabilities. The final principle, robust. This means that a wide variety of assisted technologies, such as screen readers for people with visual disability, should be able to interpret the content. As website and digital content technology evolves, the content should continue to remain accessible. This means that digital environment design should maximize compatibility with current and future user tools. It also means that there needs to be somebody who is monitoring the digital content over time to ensure that it remains accessible. As Erin mentioned in her introduction, technology has great potential to break down barriers in digital environments, but it can also create new obstacles. For example, voice activated systems can improve accessibility for people with motor control disabilities. However, these devices and systems may be inaccessible to people with speech disabilities. Speaking from my own experience, we can't seem to train our Google Home device to recognize my deaf voice, which I think you would probably agree is really pretty clear. But for some reason, our Google device can't recognize it. Auto captioning is another great example of technology that both breaks down and creates new barriers in digital environments. Auto captioning is a definite benefit for deaf and hard of hearing people in certain situations. Just yesterday, I was attending an online conference session on creative placemaking for people with disabilities. And the organizer of the conference thought that captioning would be included in the default package for the online conferencing platform that he was using. It turned out it wasn't. And so I was able to go to Google Chrome and turn on the auto captioning extension. And then I was able to follow along with the um, presentation, primarily because the speaker was conscious of speaking slowly and distinctly so that the auto captioning would be accurate. When people don't speak slowly and clearly, you get a poor output in auto captioning, which is the reason we often call it auto caption. Auto captioning does not handle noisy environments, accents, or high level discourse very well. I couldn't, for example, use auto caption to attend Zoom Shakespeare productions during the pandemic. And believe me, I tried often. Auto captioning just can't handle Shakespeare. <laughs> So while as content designers and creators, you can do a lot on your own to educate yourself about universal design and accessibility in digital environments, you should always seek feedback from disabled users. Good places to make connections with disabled consultants 
include disabled student services offices at your institution and local or national disability rights organizations or local and national disability affinity groups, such as, for, um, such as a, an organization for the deaf. You should always try to compensate people for their disability access labor. I know that there are participants from various countries here today, so I can only offer general guidelines about sources of funding for accessibility and digital adaptation. If you work in a country with strong disability civil rights law, your own educational institution is a good place to start. Upper level administrations, administrators often have budgets that can be tapped for inclusion costs. Government agencies are also another potential source of funds. Here in the United States, more and more agencies are requiring grant applicants to address disability access plans and to budget for access. Also in the United States, private foundation or donors are a potential source of funds for accessibility costs. So I believe no matter what country you're in, the money is there to support accessibility and inclusion um, measures in your digital environment and products. It's just important that you begin by building these considerations and cost into your projects from the very start. And that I think is my biggest takeaway that I hope you leave my presentation from, the importance of starting with accessibility consideration from the onset of your projects. Thank you for your time today and I look forward to our discussion. And I'm going to drop in the link I mentioned into the chat right now. Thank you so much, Jill, um, for sharing your thoughts and expertise with us, and also for helping us as we go learn how to make our sessions better. And I think we're still in the process of learning, um, but I really appreciate that. And we're also hopefully trying to slow down the way we speak. I think as academics, we sometimes try to spit out too much too quickly. And that's a really helpful point of feedback, as is all of the suggestions you've offered. So we're going to save question and answer to the very end of the session after all three speakers have talked. But if people have questions that they want to put in the Q&A as we go so that we have them to hand, then you're very welcome to do so. I'm going to introduce our second speaker now, Stefan Kuharchik, who's the founder of Articulate Education, a creative consultancy for schools. He's a veteran primary school teacher, an associate lecturer for the Open University, and a PhD student at the University of Sheffield. His research focuses on creativity in education, digital literacy, and Shakespeare in primary teaching. He's the author of Teaching Shakespeare in Primary Schools, All the World's a Stage, in which he outlines methods for engaging young children in Shakespeare. In his book, Stefan argues that, this is his writing, his wonderful writing, making use of technology to support how children understand, perform, and respond to Shakespeare's plays is not just about making it relevant, it is authentically Shakespearean. And he references the way that Shakespeare and his contemporaries embraced lots of different story, forms of storytelling in their own work. Um, so I will turn over to Stefan now. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you for that, Erin. Uh, I'm just going to share my PowerPoint before I get started. Um, and let me just see if I can. Okay, I think uh, you should be able to see my PowerPoint and, and my face at the same time. Um, okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, um, or morning or evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Stefan Kuharczyk. Uh, I'm really delighted to be part of this uh, interesting series of talks. So, uh, so thank you very much, Erin, for inviting me uh, and involving me in, in the series. Uh, and for that warm introduction, I'm still reeling from the word veteran teacher. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't think of myself as that, but that's a, 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 a kind way to describe it. Uh, so I'm going, to, yes, I'm going to try and follow uh, Jill's interesting talk uh, by discussing my experiences of working in a primary education in England and helping children access Shakespeare through filmmaking workshops. 
Um, so a little bit about me, uh, just to summarise, Erin um, uh, has done that quite well already, but just to say I am a former primary school teacher um, and I'm based in England, in uh, northern England, in a city called Leeds. Uh, and I've been working as part of Articulate Education since 2014 when I left full-time teaching. Um, so this, the work that I do with primary schools is heavily arts-based and I use a lot of digital technology. This work is very, something that's very important to me. Uh, and I'm very passionate about it. And as Erin mentioned, I've also um, gone on to extend this into my research and my PhD um, is looking at video games and the relationship between video gaming and children's identities and writing practices. Uh, so this very much fits with uh, my interest in filmmaking. I should also say that my interest in, um, in my background, sorry, is most definitely in education. And I come to Shakespeare as a teacher rather than a scholar. So I'm not one of those people who can quote Shakespeare freely, uh, but I do love his plays and I love watching them adapted and performed, uh, which is partly why uh, I was so, uh, felt it was so important to share these with children. Uh, so that is me, um, almost. I should just also point out uh, and re repeat, Erin um, mentioned my book, uh, an opportunity to shamelessly plug uh, my new book about teaching Shakespeare in primary schools, just £20 um, and you could make Shakespeare very happy. It's his, his birthday this week, I believe, possibly. Um, but the ideas that I'm going to talk about today are uh, from this book. Um, and this is my first book that I've published and I was quite excited to see that it is uh, listed in Amazon in the top one million books. Um, which I believe the bigger the number is, the better it is. It's the people in the first 10 places that I feel sorry for. <laughs> um, yes, so, um, so the ideas I'll be talking about uh, are, are drawn from uh, my book. So there, there are two uh, things that I want to talk to you about uh, regarding Shakespeare. Uh, the first is that I think that it's fundamentally important that we include children in discussions about literature. And as part of that, uh, the place of classic literature, such as Shakespeare, uh, and the value we attach to it as a society. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is about filmmaking and about how I found filmmaking to be an excellent and inclusive medium uh, to help children participate in the discussion of art, but also the production of art, in the ways children use film as a way of remixing and reimagining stories in ways that aren't always possible, uh, or is accessible in doing so through uh, written uh, work, which is often what children's uh, creative work looks like in school. Um, I won't read you uh, through my complete reading list, but there's just a list there of some of the, um, the academic literature that I've read that's helped me transition my ideas from practice into more scholarly work and research, especially uh, Janet Coles and Theo Bry's work about reading as enactment uh, that was in relation to Beowulf, the old English poem. Um, but actually, most of what they talked about was really relevant to how um, Shakespeare and other classic literature is shared with, with uh, primary school teachers and children. So let's unpick those ideas a little bit further. Um, my interest in teaching Shakespeare uh, emerged a few years ago, and I was observing more and more schools teaching classic literature as part of their curriculum. In the primary school curriculum in England, there's a requirement for the um, key stage two children, that's the upper years of primary, uh, to study uh, literature from our heritage. That's what it's called in the curriculum. And a lot of schools reach for Shakespeare in order to fill this gap. Now, it was also interesting as a consultant uh, to, for me to visit lots of different schools and see Shakespeare's face uh, on posters and on displays um, in, in many different settings. And here he was promoting um, the, uh, a policy of the British government, which is for education promotes British values. Uh, I'm raising my eyebrows at that. I'm, I'm happy to discuss that again later. Um, so, so it might be surprising for some of you to realize that Shakespeare has such a presence in primary education. Um, many teachers are actually more surprised when I actually try and teach it to primary age children. Um, they ask questions about things like, you know, is, uh, isn't Shakespeare too hard? Um, a lot of questions about the language and about whether children should be spending their time reading something that's much more modern rather than uh, older texts. In terms of inclusion, we could think about 
concerns about children who, uh, for whom English isn't their first language or children who have special educational needs. Um, I don't actually agree with that. I think it's entirely right that children in primary schools are taught to engage with Shakespeare's plays, just like any other works uh, by any other author. And not because it's good cultural capital, which is uh, a, a, a new focus of, um, of Ofsted, which um, are, are in charge of school inspections in England. Um, Shakespeare shouldn't be engaged with just because it's good cultural capital at all, but instead because Shakespeare's imprint, his cultural imprint, uh, is everywhere. You know, we find Shakespeare's fingerprints in, in many of the stories, and many of them are written for children. Uh, things like The Lion King, um, Star Wars has got many elements of Shakespeare in it, um, and then things like Noughts and Crosses by Mallory Blackman. Um, so for me, I think this makes uh, knowing about Shakespeare very good value for children. So in 2016, I started designing creative writing workshops for children based around Shakespeare's plays. And the principles that guided these have evolved over a number of years. And I've spent a lot of time reflecting on what I wanted children to get out of it. Um, I don't ever feel I've quite got it right yet, but it is still a bit of a work in progress. Um, but the, the main principles you can see there on the screen, I'll just talk through those quite briefly. So, um, the first principle of my teaching around Shakespeare is that the pedagogy should be active and inclusive. Um, Rex Gibson wrote about this when he, uh, in his famous book about teaching Shakespeare in, in schools. Um, but we would take this further. And, um, and I think that it shouldn't just be physically active, but something that invites children to take action. So part of this is how a play like, uh, for example, Romeo and Juliet is presented to the children. You know, is it something they have to extract the meaning from, like a puzzle? Um, extract sounds like rather painful dental work to me. Or is it something that we ask them to make meaning from? So we're thinking about what the words sound like and what they feel like. Um, Emma Smith writes about this in, um, in her work about Shakespeare, about how to access Shakespeare. And she sort of encourages people um, to sort of try to forget working out what Shakespeare meant because he's dead and after all, of, and it, perhaps it doesn't really matter so much when you're coming to Shakespeare for the first time. Instead, um, I, I mean, I, like, I quite like this advice and I think it's really appropriate to, to working with children. So we think instead about what do his, his words mean to us? And I think with children, this enables them to do much more with it. Uh, even if there are things that they might miss out on with the play, um, but I, I sense that practitioners are often a bit unsure about how much license they have to let the children be flexible with the text. So secondly, uh, I wanted my teaching to be relevant. So I wanted children on one hand to be able to see some of that timeless quality of Shakespeare's plays in the characters, the scenarios, um, the plots. But I also wanted to make it relevant in terms of pedagogy. Some children are much more comfortable, I think, with writing for film than just writing. Um, and it validates a lot of their experiences uh, in using technology at home. You know, in terms of inclusion, I think film is much more familiar, say, uh, than theatre to children. And, you know, in working with primary school children for a number of years, I've often found that they are much more comfortable in front of a video camera than they are perhaps stepping into a performance space. It feels a lot less risky. And you know, they, they're aware that you can go back and re-record the lines if they make a mistake or edit out mistakes. Uh, finally, uh, I also want my teaching to, be, to acknowledge the children's agency. So I wanted to give the children as much ownership over the process as practical. Um, mainly this uh, meant letting them in on some of the decision-making about what we do with the text once we've read it. And I think I'm still grappling with how to do that more successfully. But um, I found that that is a really uh, important way of, of making the teaching of Shakespeare inclusive. Um, so to, oh, my little animations, there you go. So to give you um, a few more specifics here, I wanna share with you a case study on uh, creating a writing project that I ran um, in 2018 with a group of primary school aged children, uh, aged 10 to 11. So the, the children were in year six, which is the final year of English primary school. Uh, and it was based on uh, work we did with, um, on, on the play Julius Caesar. And that turned into a film called The Rise and Fall of Julius Caesar. Um, there's a link there at the bottom if you would like to go and watch the, um, if you'd like to go back and watch that film. 
Um, so the school that I did the work with is based in England, in Northern England, in Leeds. Um, it, we, I met with the children over seven weeks uh, with, with 12 children. The school is a very diverse population. It's an inner city school. So it's in a, in a multi-ethnic, multilingual catchment area um, with high levels of economic deprivation. The children who were chosen for the workshop were children chosen by their teachers. They were described as strugglers. Um, I'm doing air quotes for strugglers. So these were typically children performing below age related expectations, often because of their language abilities, uh, a possible learning need, maybe like dyslexia, or indeed their behaviour. The children weren't very familiar with Shakespeare when I sort of first met them. Um, I did open with a discussion about who, what they knew about Shakespeare. They knew very little about him. Uh, they knew that he was famous and they knew, they'd heard of Romeo and Juliet, but they couldn't really tell me uh, how long ago he was writing, how culturally significant he was. It, that some of them were aware, though, that you did go on to study Shakespeare uh, when you were in secondary school. So that this uh, made them feel quite excited they were getting to do it um, earlier in their education. So I'll keep the process of the project here brief. I'm happy to go into more details later. Um, but the project had basically three stages. Uh, the first one was about immersing the children in the story. So here we discuss the theme of themes of the play, so just fairness, decision making, authority and power. And we did that before we did any reading. And then we looked at um, some selected scenes from the play as a group. And I acted as a narrator to try and link those scenes together. Oops. And then we um, moved on to engaging the children with the story. So uh, that involves sort of profiling some of the main characters, uh, doing group role plays in some of the scenes. Um, that feature in the play, and then lots of discussion, especially drawing parallels with the children's lives. I'll talk about that more in a moment. And then the final stage was about remixing the story. So we reimagined the story by planning uh, something that was parallel to the plot of Julius Caesar, but set in the school. Um, and then we wrote scripts together, and then the final stage was filming, filming the story. Um, for this project, I wasn't overly focused on the language. I had been in earlier projects, but for this one, I just wanted to focus more on how the children uh, made uh, sense of the words. How did the, the dialogue make the children act rather than what the words meant specifically? And just in terms of inclusion, I really feel that that simple step can involve children who are, might otherwise sort of opt out of uh, literature studies. So I did some mediation of the tricky language, uh, but I made an effort to impose a meaning on the language, uh, on the words the characters speak. And even in some scenes, when we looked at, say, like the assassination of Caesar, we even dispensed with the words altogether. And we just focused on conveying the lines through body language, facial expressions. So it was much more sensory than just reading, uh, reading aloud. And then we spent a lot of time talking about parallels between the themes of Julius Caesar and the children's lives, people they knew, events and other stories. So when we came to reimagine it for a film, the children were able to loosely plot the story of Julius Caesar against in a context that made sense to them. So Julia Caesar becomes a boss, bossy child who wants to take complete control of the school council and how her friends then react to this. And then the film comes to a head when they ambush her in the dinner hall and there's a food fight and everybody gets into trouble and they have to sort of make impassioned speeches to get themselves out of trouble with the, with the head teacher. So it was a lot of fun uh, to, talk, to, to uh, put this film together. So when we started, though, it was started about with Shakespeare's play, but then it ended up as becoming a story about fairness, which is a theme that was critical, critically important to the children. Um, in the end, I would say the children's understanding was probably a bit blurred between what was in Shakespeare's play and what was in their story. But I felt that they'd really made something out of it that was relevant to them and that was funny to them. Things that they really laughed at uh, that they wanted to include in the, in the story, including the food fight. So what they'd done, I felt, was really anchor it, really tether the play to their reality and make it much more relevant. And in doing so, I felt that they really breathed new life into it and they produced a new version of it that didn't exist before. So I've talked a little bit about digital already. I won't repeat uh, my points here, but I'll just, I'll just like to finish by saying that I don't think this level of reimagining a story like Julius Caesar would necessarily have been possible if it had been done just as a written story. Um, the digital helped the children sort of take the next step, I think. Um, 
And I think digital technology, I found, helps. I found that children are much more literate in this than, than we often give them credit for. Certainly when interrogating films and television. So for example, when trying to work out a character's motivation through the camera shot or lighting or music, the children are much more confident about talking about it from their experiences of watching films. And they don't get much of this from their formal education, but I really like how this crosses the boundary between um, their home life and what we do in school. So it really validates their, their digital practices at home. And this has obviously become much more relevant during the pandemic. Um, and finally, I'll just repeat something that Erin touched on at the beginning, um, in the introduction. Um, something that often strikes schools when I go in to talk about film is that they think film is very innovative. And it is, but I mean, also film is an art form more than 100 years old. So I don't use technology because of the novelty value, but because of its power for telling stories. And as Erin mentioned, I think that technology is an authentically Shakespearean thing to do for, for storytelling. So his stories, his audiences would have seen moving stages and there's live cannon fire on um, stage for a production of Henry VIII, I think, that burnt the fist down. So uh, really, um, we didn't do any of that in school, I should point out. <laughs> but I think that making that link with technology really adds a whole other layer of appreciation onto Shakespeare's work. Um, I'm really interested to hear um, Amrita's talk, Dr. Amrita's uh, talk in, um, following this, because uh, she talks about um, digital storytelling. Um, in the future, I'd like to sort of explore this further in terms of um, exploring Shakespeare stories in the virtual world. So the potential of things like Minecraft, um, designing games in Roblox, where children can, can build a world that is similar to one, uh, something they've seen in one of Shakespeare's plays and try to role play the story in that. I'm also interested in genre crossovers. So things that children are culturally interested in, things like Star Wars, seeing how that, uh, the threads of those kind of films can be found in Shakespeare's plays and vice versa. Um, that's the end of my talk, bit of an abrupt end there, sorry. <laughs> but um, thank you for listening. Um, and the link to my book there is, uh, is there on the screen. Um, I look forward to uh, listening to the next talk. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about the work I do, you can obviously be having a discussion next, but you can also uh, uh, visit my website or follow me on social media. Um, that'd be great. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stefan. Um, lots of questions again. I'll save them um, until uh, after our final talk, which is from Amrita Sen, who is Associate Professor and Deputy Director of UGC Human Resource Development Centre at the University of Calcutta. And she's also an affiliated member of its English department. Her research focuses on the cultural and performance history of early modern and Shakespearean drama, as well as the long and rich history of Shakespearean performance in contemporary India. She is the editor of a forthcoming book that I'm really excited about on digital Shakespeare's from the global south, which according to you know, the, the sort of material on the website, which we'll share with you in a minute, redirects current conversations on digital appropriations of Shakespeare away from its Anglo-American bias. In her work on Indian film adaptations of Shakespeare's plays, she illuminates how, and this is her, her work and her writing, how Shakespearean plots get stitched into the fabric of Indian creative works, producing radical new versions of classic drama and stretching its meaning beyond traditionally Anglophone channels. So without further ado, I will turn over to Amrita Sen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin, for that kind introduction. And um, I've been listening to both Jill and Stefan with great fascination. Um, so I'm going to try and um, share my PowerPoint. Um, fingers crossed. That, that might have worked. I can see it, Amrita. It's in the, um, it's not quite in the final display mode, but I can certainly uh, see it. Right, so I'm gonna try and... It might be if you go to the view button at the top on the right. Yeah. 
Wonderful, perfect. Did that work? Yes, it did. Fabulous. Thank you, Eric. Um, so um, I want to talk about digital Shakespeare's in India today, um, experiencing digital Shakespeare's in India. And to talk about digital Shakespeare's in India is to talk about two Indias. The first is Metropolitan, Anglophone, and tech savvy. The second is mostly rural with limited access to internet devices or bandwidth. To think about digital remixes of classics in the global south is to confront questions of access and inclusion that are quite distinct. Not everyone experiences the digital in the global south in the same way, but then, as we shall see, not everyone experiences Shakespeare the same way either. The specific adaptation that I wish to discuss here is British Council's Mix the Play version of Romeo and Juliet, an interactive video platform. Mix the Play was part of the Shakespeare Lives, a series of events that commemorated 400 years of Shakespeare's death, uh, 2016, but uh, Mix the Play itself was released end of 2016, early 2017, especially the Romeo and Juliet version. Mix the Play lets you devise your own scenes by choosing stage settings, actors, costumes, etc. Unlike the earlier version of Mix the Play, based on Midsummer Night's Dream, the Romeo and Juliet version, despite being an international collaboration funded by the British Council, was more of an Indian adaptation. This was because the production team, as well as the scenes offered, were primarily Indian. The director of Mix the Play, Romeo and Juliet, is Royston Abel, a noted theater personality and founder of the Indian Shakespeare Company. The scene that one gets to recreate is the iconic balcony scene. One gets to choose a uh, amongst Indian theater and film actors like Kalki Kochlin, um, who is uh, French born, but uh, acts on the Indian stage and is very much an Indian actor in a cosmopolitan globalized sense. And the other actors are Kriti Pant, Adil Hussain, and Pushar Pandey for the roles of Juliet and Romeo. The viewer or player gets to review the audition clips. There are three possible scenarios that one might choose from traditional, culture clash and modern life. True to its name, traditional is the most conventional setting with actors donning European period costumes and relying on fairly rigid reading of what the balcony as a theatrical space might amount to. In contrast, culture clash, and that's to your um, bottom left, pits you with a sari clad Hindu Juliet against a Muslim Romeo. While adaptations of Romeo and Juliet have been quite popular on screen and stage with Bollywood blockbusters like Kayamat Se Kayamat Tak as early as 1988, it is only recently with the rise of right-wing politics that the Hindu-Muslim theme has become more prominent for instance, Oporna Sen's 2015 film, Ashinogor, shows a Hindu Romeo and a Muslim Juliet. If the culture clash scenario encourages one to engage with questions of communal harmony and religious inclusion, then the third and final option takes one to the dystopic world of corporate India. And uh, this is uh, the one to the right, actually. The options of locations include a trendy coffee shop where Juliet is an artist who confronts her corporatized Romeo. 
these scenarios in many ways make Shakespeare's play more relevant to the immediate reality of the Indian subcontinent today. They provide an important forum for the players or users to confront questions like communal violence and rapid corporatization in ways that traditional media cannot mix a play as a digital platform allows one to play with multiple interpretations and scenarios at the same time. To a growing tech savvy population, Shakespeare can be engaged with and in, in a new and arguably exciting way. Mixer Play has been marketed by the British Council as an educational tool and as an extension of its resources worldwide aimed at promoting English literature and culture. If the video platform uh, was used in school competitions, such as one in South Calcutta that I happen to judge, then it was also screened by the British Council at college fests and book fairs. Even in neighboring Bangladesh, Mix the Play is advertised specifically as an educational tool. So the obvious question that arises is, who is Mix the Play, Romeo and Juliet, aimed at? The video platform is readily available online and should in theory be widely accessible. The two plays in question, Romeo and Juliet and Midsummer Night's Dream are standard features in school and college curriculum across India. It is here, however, that we run into the problems of the two Indias. The first is a linguistic one. Mix the play is exclusively in English. Even the subtitles, which are aimed for greater accessibility, are in English. This leaves out non-native audiences. It is perhaps worthwhile here to remind us of the history of English education and of Shakespeare transmission in India. In 1835, Thomas Babington Macaulay's infamous Minute on Indian Education proposed to take away East India Company funding of Arabic, Persian, and Sanskrit. Instead, Macaulay aimed to create, and I quote here, a class of persons Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect, end quote. This elite Anglophone class still exists in post-independence India. In elite schools and colleges across the subcontinent, the medium of instruction is English, with vernacular literature relegated to fixed hours in the curriculum. It is to this metropolitan, globalized audience that Mix the Play would be the most accessible to. This same audience would arguably have more chance to see live performances of Shakespeare or indeed participate in amateur productions themselves. Shakespeare, as part of standardized higher education syllabus, is not, however, restricted to the cities. In rural colleges, often catering to first-generation students, Shakespeare is also compulsory. So I teach at the University of Calcutta, one of the oldest European style universities in Asia, and one of the earliest places where Shakespeare was formally taught as part of an English literature curriculum. But my work also involves faculty training, and I routinely come across young assistant professors educated in elite Indian universities, who as part of the college service, itself a colonial remnant, are posted to rural colleges where teaching Shakespeare becomes an act of translating Shakespeare. This population who might actually have benefited the most from the opportunity of mixing and matching scenes, actors, and soundtrack would largely find Mix the Play linguistically inaccessible. 
to talk of the digital in India and the rest of the global South is to also talk of the digital divide. The digital divide exists not only between the global North and South, but within the global South itself. During the pandemic, which forced ill-prepared schools and colleges to shift to online instruction, the stark digital divide between elite, urban and rural students became obvious. There were newspaper reports of village students walking for miles and climbing on trees to write exams because internet signals were not available in their homes. Even in urban areas where internet signals are stronger, not all households may own multiple smartphones or laptops, which means that scant resources would have to be shared, decisions regarding which may well be taken along gender lines. So maybe the girl child will get left out. Uh, maybe she will not have access to the smartphone at all. Moreover, digital inequalities can also run along existing social inequalities, such as the caste divide. It is also important to remember that even in the largest public universities, we do not have access to subscription-based online instruction systems. Even for us, Google Classroom emerged as the most obvious, or shall I say, the only choice. Even in cities, bandwidth problems meant that classes were held with videos firmly switched off. For my colleagues teaching in rural colleges, it meant teaching Shakespeare on WhatsApp, a free file sharing and voiceover IP service. Given these structural problems, even accessing a freely available educational tool like Mix the Plate would come with difficulties. Right. So these problems, however, are not unique to Mix the Plate. Instead, there are challenges that any digital platform or even collaboration must confront. If the purpose of digitizing the classics is to retain their relevance, then we need to become more critically aware of who we are leaving behind in our sprint for the digital. We need to come up with low cost and flexible solutions, solutions that we improvise along the way. And I'm going to end uh, my little um, talk here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amrita, and thank you to all our speakers. I'll give you a physical clap, and I'm sure that all of our attendees are clapping along at home, whether it's in the chat um, or themselves. Uh, so we're going to move into the question and answer part of the seminar. And the format for the speakers is that we will turn on our video when we want to say something and turn it off when we don't. Um, but our attendees, please, I invite you, if you have questions, to submit them through the Q&A button um, in the Zoom feature. We'll also keep an eye on the chat. And actually, Deborah and I will take turns either asking a question ourselves or putting one forward um, from the Q&A. So I will start with quite a general question that I think might be relevant to all our speakers. Um, and Ironically, because I'm the host, I can't put it into the Q&A button, so I will put it into the chat as well as speak it. Um, it's, uh, I want to thank you again for all your wonderful presentations uh, and say that digital technology is often celebrated for its quote unquote democratizing power. But listening to you and reading more about the subject area sometimes makes me wonder if digital or multimodal, multimodal adaptations, to use Jill's word, can actually be more exclusionary than analog presentations at time. Um, it's a very broad question, um, but if anyone has any thoughts, I'd welcome them. And we'll also then also turn over to questions from the audience. Apologies, it's a bit of a broad question. Right. Um, 
I don't think that they are inherently more exclusionary. Um, I mean, there's no question that the digital adaptations can broaden um, the audience. Um, they can make the classics more relevant to um, specific social circumstances and cultures. Um, so I definitely think there is a dem democratizing element in digital adaptation, but without careful thought, I think is when they become exclusionary. But, Thank you so much. Yes, Stefan. Um, thank you. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I, we're thinking about, um, I, I mean, I was just thinking back when Amrita was talking there about um, availability of Wi-Fi and devices. Um, certainly with um, participating in digital performances, um, I mean, I'm very lucky to live in a country which has uh, pretty good access to Wi-Fi and to have access to devices um, where it seems quite commonplace. Actually, I would say where I live in Leeds, which is uh, the top of a hill, uh, we get a bit of an internet black spot. So I, I remember during the pandemic, trying to access online um, adaptations was incredibly difficult, um, including um, interactive digital uh, production of Midsummer Night's Dream done by the RSC, uh, Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, so perhaps a little insight into, um, you know, how a lot of these, yeah, the, what I'm going to call the race for the digital can perhaps leave certain people behind or exclude people from cultural spaces. Um, in, in terms of making or creating um, digital adaptations of Shakespeare, um, one of the things that I find interesting uh, working with schools using technology is that some schools that I work, have worked with have um, a, an abundance of digital resources. So they will have a whole set of iPads for a whole class, um, lots of laptops, digital cameras, uh, lots of space as well that can be used for um, for digital um, for, for as like film sets. Uh, you you know if you're making a film in a busy primary school, uh, sort of going through the corridors, uh, and if you watch the Julius Caesar film, if, it, if you watch any of it, you'll see at the beginning um, there are lessons happening in a very cramped corridors outside, and we're trying to film in between it all, which makes it all seem very authentic. Um, but a lot of schools, there is a bit of a divide in terms of what schools have available uh, for making digital performances. Um, and I think that has only been excess, um, exacerbated by sort of budgetary cuts to schools um, where there are real haves and have nots um, in terms of what they have available and whether schools are able to offer any kind of aspect of digital storytelling um, uh, in, in the curriculum. I know as a teacher, I worked in schools uh, in Birmingham, uh, in the middle of England, the Midlands, where um, the school were struggling even to buy stationery, let alone iPads. You know, that was sort of, that was way out of our reach. Um, so it's a good question. It's something I would cer certainly think about in terms of um, uh, access to, to creating digital stories. Um, and something I'll certainly ponder on when coming to do my PhD, uh, which is all about video games and, and using schools as digital gaming spaces as well. So. Um, I'm sure that that is something that will uh, will come up again. I think I would actually agree with uh, both Jill and Stefan in and sort of add to that. And um, I think the digital um, can offer a lot of um, opportunities and. Um, means of participation that might not be available otherwise. And that was true, especially during the pandemic, um, where uh, more of our students, for instance, could participate in international uh, conferences and seminars that would otherwise be out of the question because of uh, problems of airfare and uh, visa regulations and everything else. 
So it, it, it does open up a, a, a lot of avenues, uh, but I think as with any technology, I think it, it, it sort of comes with its own set of problems. And I think we need to be aware of these. And um, I, I think it's also really important for us um, to include in our uh, critical conversations, not only the more popular globally visible uh, digital platforms, but also the other seemingly low tech ones, the ones that are improvised, um, the ones that are uh, being used um, like, like WhatsApp, for instance, um, where a lot of potentially interesting uh, pedagogic strategies are being developed um, that would otherwise go, go ignored. Thank you so much, all three of you. It's, it's, it's great to know that the idea of the democratizing force isn't a complete fallacy, but also that it's one that maybe we need to be cautious about and think about more, as you say, holistically, inclusively from the beginning. I'm gonna turn over now to my co-chair, Deborah, for the questions. Yeah, I see we've got one um, question in, in the chat, um, but I've got one of my own that I'd really like to ask first if I'm, uh, if I'm allowed to, and I'll put it in the, the chat as well for people to see. And that, that is, I, I wonder if the panelists could, could, could ask my question about the potential conflict between Shakespeare's own ableist or um, racist bias, if you like, and our, our efforts to make him um, more accessible, his work more accessible. And I'm, I'm thinking of some of the characters that, you know, um, who, 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 have, who have issues like Richard III or, um, Aaron and Titus Andronicus. And I see Jill's got her hand up, so I'd be really keen to hear what she has to say. Jill, do you want to speak? Sorry, trying to navigate my controls. Um, so it's a great question, and it's something that I personally struggle with when I teach Shakespeare. Um, as someone who loves the language, um, as someone who loves working with the language and translation into ASL um, and struggling with the representations of um, disabled people with disabilities um, in his plays um, and you know, seeing also the struggles that other people have with representations of their ethnic or religious um, identity. Um, how do you balance those um, in teaching? And on the one hand, um, looking at and analyzing those representations can be a great springboard to talking about the issues in that still exist in our contemporary society. Um, and I also often teach Shakespeare in the context of adaptation and appropriation. So we talk a lot about how Shakespeare can be rewritten um, and in ways that interrogate those um, negative representations um, of peoples and identities. Um, so I will often teach, um, you know, for example, if I were to teach Richard III, I might teach it alongside Teenage Dick, which interrogates um, this whole issue of using a disability to represent something fundamentally flawed about the character's psychology. So I think there are ways to address these issues that are uh, sensitive and also provoke students to think broadly um, about the issues um, that are very much still persist today. Um, and I think digital adaptations can be a great way to tackle those um, questions too. That's how I would kind of wrestle with and approach that in my teaching. Stefan, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. That's a, um, that's a really interesting question. Um, and something uh, I've certainly given a lot of thought um, in, in my work with primary school children, especially in very diverse schools. 
Um, I mean, a lot. I mean, even just thinking about literature in general and how you approach the, uh, some issues about um, uh, representation, how people are represented in storybooks, and thinking about the audience you're sharing them with, you know, that group of children sitting in front of you on, on the carpet. Um, when we are, um, you know, I think how important it is, the discussion about what kind of literature is shared with children is about representation. So can children see themselves in characters positively, should we say, see themselves positively reflected in the characters who they're reading about? And with Shakespeare, it's, it's, it's problematic, especially when you work in um, a very diverse class. On one hand, this presents a challenge for a teacher, I think, because if you if you act on this and you try to bring in discussions about race and identity, um, then I, th I would, I fear like there might be a problem with you like imposing your agenda, imposing on how to read the play. On the other hand, it's not, it's not good enough for classrooms to be colorblind. So, you know, you, uh, these things are important. Um, it's, you know, some children, their racial identity, their ethnic identity is, is hugely important to them and to ignore those kind of things um, sort of leaves doesn't validate their identity you see what I mean and, and doesn't challenge discrimination I have to say it has not come up with the groups I've worked with necessarily certainly on Julius Caesar which is a very diverse group and they didn't seem to I think taking the action out of classical Italy and take, putting it into a school in Leeds certainly helped with making connections with the characters uh, but if you were studying a place such as the Tempest, with the proper characters such as Caliban and how, how he's represented as a monster, as a Caliban, the cannibal, you know, thinking about uh, how does that sit comfortably alongside topics that you might do about island nations or about uh, ge geography and thinking about people in other countries and how they might be represented. Um, so I think there is an important question to ask there. Um, it should be something at the forefront of teachers' minds. I would say the, the, the biggest thing that's come up with making Shakespeare accessible would be with gender um, and about talking to, uh, to primary school children about you know, have they noticed about what kind of roles the different characters have in the different plays. You know, a lot of the men are the, the wizards and the soldiers and all of the women are the or the female parts are the um, sort of like supporting roles, should we say. It gives the men something to talk about, I think, is uh, what one academic described it as. Um, and asking children to, to try to readdress the gender roles and how would the characters behave differently if uh, Macbeth was a, uh, was a woman? Uh, would he be, behave differently? I think really provokes some interesting questions in terms of access and inclusion and really gets the children thinking as well. They like that kind of stuff. That's great. Um, Amrita, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I find this really, really interesting. I think that's a great question, and Deborah. And um, I think I have uh, two different uh, sort of re responses to, to that. One has to do with uh, mixer play specifically, which in in both versions allows you to play with race, so to speak, um, especially in um, well in in in, in a Midsummer Night's Dream, but also in um, Romeo and Juliet, because uh, Kalki Kochlin is there. But it doesn't acknowledge um, colorism, which uh, runs deep in, in India and Indian culture, which um, sort of privileges whiteness to the extent that uh, you have um, whitening creams for uh, women and now also for men, uh, which, which are supposed to make you fairer. Um, it, it, it doesn't feel really uh, a, a, a address those questions. Um, although it, it, it sort of raises other uh, social issues. So um, that's, that's mixed with play, but when it comes to the broader question, I think that um, you're rightly asking, Deborah, is, 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 is the continued relevance of uh, Shakespeare, um, given uh, the problems with uh, some of his plays, as you're rightly pointing out, uh, 
one of my favorite lines still is uh, from the Tempest, right? You, you taught me language and the profit of it is that I have learned to curse. And I think a lot of uh, post-colonial adaptations and readings is about the importance of cursing um, in the sense of uh, writing back to empire and writing back um, to the colonial legacy. Um, but also, and uh, I've sort of written about this before, but I think it's important to reiterate at this stage is that in um, post independence India, in a lot of uh, the countries going through decolonization, which have um, internal uh, fractures and political hierarchies, Shakespeare actually becomes a really useful means to avoid censure and to talk about provocative themes and issues that would otherwise not be allowed. So people can get away with voicing dissent um, precisely because it is Shakespeare. And I think it really opens up or can open up an important space for marginalized communities within post-independence nations. Um, that sort of allows them to register uh, political and social dissent. And it is possible precisely because Shakespeare, much like the English language itself, is, is tied to colonial legacies and therefore is, quote unquote, a, a neutral party here. Um, and I think there is importance to that. And I would love to see um, digital adaptations do what a lot of theatrical and cinematic adaptations are doing and be brave enough, I think. That's fabulous, thank you. I'm going to pass over to Erin. Thanks for, for all those answers. We, we're now getting questions in. I'm, I'm conscious of the time too, so um, over to Erin. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you all so much. So I am keeping an eye on the time. And as much as I want to keep the discussion going, I'm, I'm also bearing in mind that part of making things inclusive and accessible is keeping to time as much as we can. So what I've done, we had two brilliant questions from Kate A. Strike in the q and I've put them into the chat. I don't know, Stefan and Amrita, if you see them. But if you do, and you have a moment to maybe, there's not much time, but give a, a one or two sentence answer, that's great. But if not, what I've said is that we'll connect everyone together um, online through email conversations following this. Um, I'm sorry that what we're learning as we go about how to work with this format. I'm learning about the tools and I'm sorry for the late start and the fact that the question session was a bit squished. Um, but I, for one, have, have genuinely learned so much. And I think one of the biggest takeaways I have from this session, from your presentations and the discussion is that we shouldn't stop trying with, you know, with different technologies, also with different authors. Um, all, you know, all of these things create lots of problems for us, cultural, political problems, practical, technological problems. We shouldn't stop trying, but we have to be aware of these problems as much as we can through discussion with people who experience them differently and have as diverse you know, networks as possible. Um, so technology opens up so many possibilities for having more diverse networks, um, but it can also reiterate some of the existing patterns. So that's, thank you so much. That's something really important that I will take away from this. Um, I wanted to invite all of our attendees to uh, put our next seminar on their calendar, which is about social media and everyday creativity, adaptations of classic texts using web 2.0 social media technologies some Shakespeare again, but also quite a lot of 19th century literature. Um, and we are excited to expand our author base out beyond into all different directions. Um, thank you all so much for participating and for your contributions. I hope this is just the start. Um, and I look forward to continuing to be in discussion with everyone. And maybe for those of you who attended, you might have some thoughts percolating in the background. Please feel free to get in touch if further thoughts come up. Also, um, we do have that opportunities to get involved in August through our online conference that Deborah mentioned, so you might keep that in mind. Um, again, I wanted to thank our panelists, my co-chair, 
our research assistant, and especially our brilliant interpreters, Christina and Jackie, who have done such amazing work for us today. So thank you all so much. I'm clapping here in Raleigh, North Carolina, in the bedroom, and really appreciating everything that people have brought here today.